and we're excited that you're joining us here today. Each message that is shared through the leadership here at Cornerstone is designed to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. However, we encourage you that this message should only be a supplement and not a replacement to the church that you should be plugged into and the pastor that God has given to shepherd and care for your soul. Enjoy and reflect and grow from this word that God has prepared. Isn't that little Mateo cute? I wanted to share that with you this morning because the Lord has impressed upon me many times that that's what I sound like to Him in my prayers. Anybody else admit to that? Oh, come on now, don't let me hang. Well, before we get started, let's pray. Father, we have come to worship you. We have worshipped you in song. We have worshipped you in our tithes and our offerings. And Father, we pray that now we might just take a few moments and set aside the concerns of the day, the thoughts of tomorrow. And Father, that we could just focus on what you have for us. Lord, I pray that you would work in a form and fashion where the church could hear what the Spirit has to say this morning. Help us, Lord, we pray, to deliver only those words. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's a blessing to be back in the pulpit of Cornerstone Deltona. The title of today's message is Intimacy in the Presence of God. Now, over the past several months, this is a topic that the Lord has been speaking to me about, and I believe He's directed me to share with you that very same message. I recently realized that in my relationship with the Lord, that I've been focusing way too much on the principles and practices of the Lord, rather than focusing on the person of Jesus Christ who is the lover of our souls. I've been very diligent trying to figure out what Jesus would have me do by studying his word, yet I've also found that in doing so many things for the Lord, I've missed actually spending intimate, personal time with him. And I've become keenly aware of the fact that first and foremost, the heart of God is that he wants us to be his bride. Hosea 2, verse 20, and I hope you take notes today. Hosea 2, verse 20, says this, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Father God is our divine husband. He has married his people in faithfulness, and he wants our relationship with him to be as close as the marriage relationship. Through the decades of my ministry as a teacher and pastor, I've been teaching that Jesus came to establish intimacy between God and man. Yet lately, he has been showing me that much of what we do as a church is trying to define God theologically, ensuring that people know about Jesus. And then we take those people that know about Jesus and go tell other people to know about Jesus. And all the while, they're learning about Jesus academically and maybe even theologically but they're not instructed how to come to know him personally and intimately. What I've learned over the past few months is this, is that our activity for the Lord, our busyness for the Lord, that is not adoration. And we need to be busy about the Lord coming from our time 
of personal time with him, letting him fill us, letting him instruct us, letting him love us so that we can love others the way he loves us. Based on the authority of God's word today, I'm here to tell you that having intimacy in the presence of God is not something we have to wait for until we get to our heavenly home. No, we can have the presence of God today, right now. On the screen for you is a passage from Jeremiah 29. It says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and listen, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Do you see that last phrase? I don't know about you, but I've realized that my communication with God through the years sometimes looks just like and sounds like little Mateo. How about you? Are you so busy wanting to make a point with the Lord that you never take time to sit quietly in his presence and simply let his love and mercy and grace soak over you and soak in you? He's waiting on each of us to seek him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I began to realize years ago the problem with my faith was that I did not have an under, a proper understanding of who God is. You see, I began to understand that my belief in God was really not the problem, but rather it was the object of my faith that was wrong. I did not have a proper understanding of just how much God really loved me. It was at that point in my life that I began to realize that God looked at me a whole lot differently than the way I looked at myself. Give your attention to the next screen, Ephesians chapter 2, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do good things he planned for us long ago. Let me challenge you tonight. Go out tonight and look up at the night sky. See the beauty of the heavens. Or have you ever been to the Rocky Mountains and seen those snow-capped mountains? Years ago, I, I had a, the ability to go to Africa, and I, I flew along the Nile, and I saw the Sahara Desert. I couldn't believe the grandeur, how big and massive that is. Maybe you've never been to any of those. Maybe go to the place that you consider the most beautiful spot you've seen on this earth. And then come back to this verse and realize that with all of those things combined, Father God considers you and me his masterpiece. Look at the next screen, 1 Peter chapter 2. But you're not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his light. I remember years ago my mentor sharing that verse with me the very first time. I responded, well, I sure don't feel like a royal priest or somebody special. And I'll never forget what he said to me right then. And I've shared it with many other young men that I've mentored. And that is this. It doesn't matter what you feel. Begin to look at your life and who you are through the eyes of the God who created you. Because when you do that, you will begin to walk by faith. And Mark, the just, shall live by faith. We need to begin to look at ourselves the way our Creator looks at us. I saved the favorite verse for the last. Look at the screen right now. It's Zephaniah three seventeen. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. 
He will take great delight in you, and his love, he will no longer rebuke you. But he will rejoice over you with singing. This verse is a promise for everyone who professes and possesses Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Can you picture the moment when he sings over you? Your perception of your identity in Christ is so very important in dealing with the struggles and strifes on this earth. Are you here today just trying to make it through this earth, knowing that someday you're going to get to get to heaven? Or are you walking in the fullness and the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God with joy in spite of the struggles, walking in peace because you are letting the Lord guide you into what you need to do each and every day? How would you like to be able to know for sure the voice of God within your spirit? How would you like to be able to just celebrate just time with him, like Adam and Eve did back in the Garden of Eden, where they would walk with their God in the cool of the day? We have that ability today, precious people, we are able to have that intimacy with him. That is why Jesus died on the cross, so that we could once again have that intimacy. If you look at many of the prayers in God's word, you'll find that at the beginning of those prayers usually refer to who God is. For example, in Psalm 90, Moses declares that the Lord has been Israel's dwelling place. The names of God are so very important. Which is why, by the way, the third commandment of the Ten Commandments says that thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, a lot of people think, well, that's just about swearing. We don't swear. Well, that's true. We, we should not use the Lord's name in that manner. But it's much more than that. We should also not misunderstand the power that we have on our lips when we invoke the name of God. Because his name is something should, that should be reverenced. It is sacred and it is holy. At the beginning of Psalm 23, it states, The Lord, and that's L-O-R-D, and it means Yahweh, or Jehovah. And that name was so sacred to the Jews that according to tradition, it would only be mentioned just one day a year, and that was on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And then it was only used by the high priest himself. When the high priest got to his deathbed, he would then share that name with the second priest. But even today, that name is so reverenced and holy that even the Jews refer to the name as Hashem. And it literally means the name. And that's why when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, guys, when you want to pray, say something like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Start off with his name. Not a request about you, but something about his name or his character. Then go on. Give him your list. But give him adoration. Give him worship first. Now I've come to enjoy lately just reading God's word back to him. And I especially enjoy reading the Psalms in my time with him. The Psalms, they're a collection of poetry really. And the Israelites actually put a lot of them to song. As a matter of fact, I remember way back in the 70s, yes, I am old, way back in the 70s, we would sing a lot of those psalms in church. But today what I'd like to do is just spend the rest of our time together looking at the first three verses, which is just one half of what I believe the greatest psalm, Psalm 23. 
Take a look at the very first slide with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, if you watch a shepherd with his sheep, it's really neat because when a shepherd goes in among his flock, those sheep will let him do whatever he wants to do. I mean, they, he can take them, put them over his neck. He can hold them upside down by the legs. He can take them and shear them. They don't care. Why? Well, that's their shepherd. They know his voice. They know that they can trust him. But if you see someone else approach a flock of sheep that's not the shepherd, man, they're gone. No way are they going to get close to those sheep. Now take a look at the verse on the screen. It says, he's not a shepherd. It doesn't say he is the shepherd. He is my shepherd. Precious people, we need to be that close to our Father God. He needs to be my shepherd. Intimate, personal. You need to know what his voice sounds like in your spirit. We need to get to the point where he's not just an image on a ceiling. He's not just the God we sing about at church. And he's not just the God of a book. No, he is my friend. He is my shepherd. It's the best gift I can give to you today is for you to understand that he wants to be something more than just who you believe in as a savior. He wants to be personal. He wants to be your bridegroom. He wants to have intimate time with you. So you get to know his voice. Now, in the Old Testament, it was written in Hebrew. And when it says, the Lord is my shepherd in Hebrew, it's on the screen for you now. You are my shepherd, Jehovah Reha. Reha. That word literally means, you are my pastor. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, let me encourage you and say, Lord, good morning. You are my Jehovah Reha. You are my pastor. Jehovah Reha, today, guide me. Lead me where you want me to be. Instruct me in what you want me to know more of today. Help me to learn more about who you are. And Father God, show me where I need to address any sin that's within me so that I can walk righteously with you. Now look at the next phrase in verse 1. I shall not want... Now, this is in the emphatic tense. And what that means is, I shall never want, I shall never lack. Now, the key to Psalm 23 really is the very first verse. So when you look at the rest of this psalm, and I hope you look at all of it today, we're just going to cover the first three, but the very first verse unlocks everything else in Psalm 23. So when it says, I shall never want or shall never lack, what is the key to that? How is it that I shall never want or never lack? Well, the fact is, if he is your shepherd, you will never want, you will never lack. You will always have what you need. Now, here's the important part of this. If you're not his, if you've never accepted him as Lord and Savior, he's not taking care of you. You're on your own. But if you are part of his flock, he is what is referred to in the Hebrew as Jehovah Jireh, our God who will provide. He will provide for you. But there is a lie out in the world today that says, oh, well, we're all God's children. No, that's a lie. We are not all God's children. We are all God's creation, and he has given each of us a soul. But until that soul has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, by accepting him as your Lord and Savior, you are not his child. 
You can be as good as you want to be, but without the blood of Jesus and walking by faith, you're not his child and you're not part of his flock. Now in his work on Psalm 23, F.B. Meyer says that even if you try to push a sheep down, he will not lie down if he is hungry. He will not lie down if he is not satisfied. However, if they are well fed, he will lie down. Now look at the psalm again. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. Next thing, I shall not want. Next, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Why is the sheep willing to lie down? Because the Lord is his shepherd and he has everything as needs. He is well fed. He is satisfied. It's interesting how that first verse just unlocks everything else. Well, how many here would really like to know and live a life knowing that Jehovah Jireh is your provider? Yeah, obviously. Never want, never lack. That's his promise. How many here believe that God will honor his promises? Amen. Well, let me read a passage to you. If you're taking notes, it's Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 28 through 33. And Jesus is speaking. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow and then thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. For those of you that put your hands up, if you believe that he is your provider, and if you believe that he will take care of you, and he will honor his promises, and he is your shepherd, meaning that he will lead you, then you will seek first his kingdom, won't you? Well, if that's the case, then why is it that many of you are spending his tithe on your kingdom? If the tithe which should have gone in the offering this morning is still in your bank account, then just how much are you really trusting your good shepherd? Why would you put your hand up when you really aren't trusting him and you're not responding to his commands? Is he really your good shepherd? The truth is, God doesn't need your money. He, he doesn't even really want your money. The truth is, all of it is his money. He just lets you keep the other 90%. All he asks is for the first fruits, the 10%, which is the tithe. As a matter of fact, our God thinks so little of our gold, of our money, that he tells us in the book of Revelation that he is going to use it as asphalt for the streets of heaven. They will be paved with gold. That's how little he thinks of our money. But here is what he really, really is concerned about. He wants your heart. He wants my heart. Not a part, portion of it. He wants all of it because he gave all for us. Amen? 
Jesus spoke a little earlier in Matthew 6, that passage I read to you. This is verse 21 of Matthew 6. And he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Precious people, please hear me. This is not condemnation. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. He just simply wants you to fall in love with him. We've already established how much he values you. Simply show your love and adoration to him by giving him his due. Hear me on this. Tithing is not a matter of money. It is a matter of the heart. And just like a little bird has to trust how God made him, that they have to trust the fact that when they leave the nest, they will start to fly. So too a Christian. D.L. Moody said that the pocketbook is usually the last part of the Christian to get sanctified. And I believe that's true. It is a matter of trust. It's not a financial matter. It is a matter of love. It is not what you're to keep. It's all his anyway. Let's move on. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. That's verse 2 of Psalm 23, Sound Booth. Verse 2. Hello back there. Thank you. Most of the pastures in Israel are very arid in climate. There's, there's not a lot of greenery. So when you come into a green pasture there, you come into an area that is very lush and full. Now ponder this with me for a moment. If you walk a flock of sheep into a green pasture that is lush and full, how can they eat it straight to dirt? They can't, because it just continues to grow, and they continue to eat. That's why they're fully satisfied, and that's why they lay down. As often as they eat, there's always supply. Precious people, we are the sheep of the good shepherd. And right here is our pasture. We can eat of this book. And as we spend time with the Lord intimately in his presence, being filled by the Spirit, we can open it up and we can look at something we've seen many times through the years. And all of a sudden it just jumps off the page to us. Because we will never, ever not be satisfied if we focus on being personally intimate with Jesus, asking his spirit to teach us, to instruct us. You can devour as much of this book as you want, but there will always be more to learn because it's not just a book. Lie down in his presence. Sit by the still waters. Trust in his provision and his protection. And as you eat, he will restore your soul. Again, the reason we lie down is because we're satisfied. But look at the world around us. They let the marketing agencies lead them around like cattle. You have to have this brand new thing. Oh, you'll be so much happier with this. Oh, this will give you great joy and satisfaction. The world goes everywhere looking for peace and never finding it. You know, it's interesting because in Psalm 23, it says he doesn't have peace for us. It says he is peace. And that's in his nature. In Isaiah, he calls him the Prince of Peace. And the covenant name is on the screen for you now. It is Jehovah Shalom, God, my peace. As I said, the world chases 
so many things to give them peace. Unfortunately, many of us in the church follow their lead. And we look everywhere but where we need to look, which is simply with the Prince of Peace. That's why it's so important to spend personal, intimate time with him. The Bible says we are to be holy as he is holy. And that means that we're to be separate from the world. Why? Well, because the only place where we are going to be able to lie down and be satisfied is with our good shepherd, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Reha, my pastor. When you turn to the one who created you and you get to know his voice, it is then that he can begin to speak to you through his pasture and fill you with the knowledge and the wisdom we need to make it through this world, giving him glory, keeping our eyes on heaven. Yet we look at so many things in our lives and we spend so much time doing things that don't bring us fulfillment, that don't bring us encouragement, that don't give us the knowledge and wisdom we need. Look at this verse from Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of the sinners or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on it day and night. When was the last time you took your Bible, you went into a room and closed the door, and just sat down and said, Lord, I just want to worship you for a little while. I just want to spend time with you and give you the praise that you deserve and thank you for my life and thank you for the blessings that you've given to me. And Father, I want you to speak to me today through your word. Father God, teach me and I'm not going to move until you speak to me. Remember that promise in Jeremiah 29 we started with? That is a promise that if you seek him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he will be found. But it doesn't say there by the church. It doesn't say by the small group. It says by you. You, personally, intimately. Yes, God will speak to us corporately. But if you want true, intimate time to get to know his voice, you need to be there alone with him. Now look at the next slide, if you would. Verse 3 of Psalm 23. He restores my soul. Once Jehovah Shalom makes us lie down in green pastures because he's satisfied us and given us peace, he then begins to restore our soul. Now, see the truth in this little phrase. Because this is inherently, we're talking about the sheep of his pasture. We're part of his flock. Why do we need to be restored? Well, because sheep tend to go astray at times, don't we? Come on now. Yeah. All right. It's true. We tend to sometimes lose our way. The word restore, it's a beautiful word in the Hebrew. And it literally means that he heals. It takes us back to the point of original origin. Now hear me in this. Do you realize that you have a God who desires to bring everything back to you that the devil has stolen from you. He will bring it back and he will restore you. It does not matter if you have been caught up into drugs. He wants to restore your life. Your marriage was great at one time and now something's just not right. He wants to bring healing to your marriage. 
Your body might be breaking down because of misuse through the years. He wants to heal it. He wants to restore it. The covenant name for this is, I could have chosen one of two words, but I chose he is my healer. And when I say healer, I'm not talking about physical healing. I'm talking about all kinds of healing. Relationships, finances, mental issues, spiritual issues, precious people. I have an announcement to make. When Jesus said in Matthew 28 that all authority has been given to me, that's still true today. God still heals. He's still in control of all. There is absolutely nothing he cannot fix if you submit it to him in love, trusting him. However, I also submit to you that he heals much more than just bodies. God does not only heal diseases. He heals everywhere we are diseased. And the covenant name is Jehovah Rapha. He restores. He brings us back to our point of departure. He will restore that which the enemy has stolen from you. You just need to remind him, Lord, you are my Jehovah Rapha. I declare you are my healer. I trust you, Lord. I don't know how to fix my marriage. Please, Lord, show me how. I don't know what to do about this issue. Lord, please guide me. Trust me. Show me. He will do it. Do you know why we push small groups here at Cornerstone? It's because there's a lot of healing that will take place in small groups. The Bible says that when we confess our sins to one another and pray for each other, we will be healed. Now listen, don't go find yourself a small group this week, walk in and start blurting out all of your sins and everything that's troubling you. You'll probably freak them out. <laughs> However, I am here to tell you that it is in small groups where you can find one or two people who you can do that with. Many of you know Bob Combs. He's a, an elder here at the church along with me. And Bob first came to Cornerstone on a Wednesday night. I happened to be here that night. I introduced myself to him, and I invited he and his wife Margie to our small group on Monday nights. They've been coming ever since. Bob and I have become really good brothers. As a matter of fact, we are now what we call accountability partners. We meet regularly, usually once a week. We probably see each other three or four times a week. But once a week, we will sit down and we hold each other accountable. We do confess our sins one to another. We share our struggles and our concerns and we pray for each other. I hope that you will find someone like that. And you will if you attend a small group. Matter of fact, how many people here are part of a small group right now? Man, that's great. Lots, lots of hands. For those of you that haven't raised your hands, let me encourage you. Go to the website. Go to the app. Find a small group. Check them out. You may need to go with one or two, but you'll find one that will fit for you. As a matter of fact, at the close of service today, when it's all said and done, we're going to show you a short video on a new small group that will be starting very soon. Precious people, the truth is this. We all have some scrapes. We all got some bruises. And we all need to pray and love on each other. Amen? Where two or more are gathered, Jehovah Rapha will show up and he will bring healing. Now take a look at this slide from 1 Peter. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Don't miss this point. He wants to do so much more than just heal your body. He truly wants to restore your soul.
Now, as we begin to wrap up, take a look at the rest of verse 3 here. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Do you see that God defines how he works with us? He doesn't coerce. He doesn't push. He leads. And he always leads us in righteousness. Now, here's another question for you. Can you say today that your life is truly led by God? If he is your shepherd, then hopefully that's the case. I mean, we say that we are followers of Jesus Christ, correct? Well, then inherently, that means that he should be leading us. If he's not our good shepherd, or if he is our shepherd, good shepherd, then we really do need to follow him. If we're not following him, then there's only one or two scenarios that's possible. The first is, you've never truly become part of his flock by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or it could be that you're one of his sheep, but you've wandered off and you've gone astray. Or, or maybe you're like little Mateo, who is so busy getting his point across that you've never really learned to listen to his voice. In the book of Hebrews chapter 13, we find the author referring to Jesus as the great shepherd of the sheep. Do you know what the great shepherd does? It says there that he will equip you with every good thing for doing his will. Beloved, the presence of God is within us if we've accepted him as our Savior. But it's so important to take advantage of the fact that his spirit is within us and nurture a relationship with him in personal time. Letting him fill you with his love, his goodness, and his mercy so that we in tune can share that with the world. I don't know what decision you have to make today. Could it be that you've publicly never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? It could be that you are one of his sheep, but you've gone astray. Or maybe, maybe you've never taken the time to get to know his voice in your spirit. If that's the case, let me encourage you to come here, accept Jesus, or rededicate your life to Jesus. Or maybe you've never been immersed in the watery graves of baptism to walk and arise in a newness of life. Whatever your decision is, now is the time to make that decision and submit yourself to the one who loves your soul. Let's all stand. Hey guys, we're so glad you plugged into this week's message. We want to connect with you. Check us out at cornerstonechurch.co. Can't wait to see you next weekend.